All right, good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in with us for our nightly prayer meeting. Uh, wanted to go ahead and mention a couple of prayer requests that you can keep in mind. Uh, just looking at the list here, uh, definitely an answered prayer. Brother Christopher is home. Chris and Denny Guy as well are home recovering. Uh, see where Miss Marge McClure has passed. So if you could please pray uh, with us for her family. And uh, they have added a name, Brother Jim Hinch, to the list as well on health. If you could please remember him in your prayers as well. Add them to your list if, if you maintain one there at the house. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And we'll jump right into the devotion, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. God, we thank you for all you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings of this life. Thank you, Lord, for even the air we breathe, Lord, the... Uh, Lord, what you've given us, Lord, I pray, God, that you'd help us not to take it for granted, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you could help us, Lord, to ever be mindful of the things that you do for us, even, Lord, when we don't realize it. Lord, I pray, God, that you'd help us to always draw near to you, Lord, and through your word and through our own personal time with you in the morning, Lord, but even this evening, Lord, as we have an opportunity to uh, study your word. I pray, God, that you'd help us to, uh, Lord, uh, as the scripture says, search the scriptures daily. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us, Lord, to benefit from your word and be not only a hearer of your word, but also a doer of it. Lord, we want to pray especially for some prayer requests that we have here, Lord. We think of, uh, Lord, those suffering with COVID right now or those just uh, with any kind of health issues. In general, Lord, I pray, God, that you'd be with them, lift them up in a very special way. Lord, we thank you so much for the answer prayer, Lord, for uh, Brother Terry Christopher, who's now in home recovering. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, Lord, your your hand upon him. I pray, God, that you'd help him and Brother Chris and Miss Denna, Lord, as, as they're home now as well. Help them, Lord, to recover and get back to their much-needed health, Lord, to get back to their daily lives, Lord, be back here worshiping you and I pray, God, that you'd be with them in a very special way this evening. Uh, Lord, we pray, God, that you'd be with Miss Marjorie McClure's family, Lord. And um, at this time, I pray, God, that you just give them peace and uh, comfort, Lord. And uh, in the days ahead, Lord, as they look at making arrangements, Lord, I pray, God, that you just be with them in a very special way. Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us, Lord, to um, always remember our brothers and sisters in Christ as we come before you in prayer. I pray, Lord, that you just uh, be with us in a very special way as we continue to try to reach this community, Lord, and, and most of all, exalt your name and to honor and glorify you in everything that we do. I pray, God, that you be with our nation, Lord. Uh, I do believe that uh, you are still in control, uh, but I also believe, Lord, that uh, we shouldn't be content on the direction our nation is heading, Lord. I pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord, as uh, believers in you. I pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord, to... Come boldly before your throne of grace, Lord, and make petitions for our nation. Lord, we want your healing. We want your presence and your provision, Lord, and your power. Uh, Lord, and that's not going to happen, Lord, if this iniquity of our nation is is come between us and a holy God. Lord, I pray, God, that you just forgive us, Lord, where we fail you. Help us, Lord, to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and, and have your healing, Lord. I pray, God, that you'd be with us in a very special way concerning that. Lord, I pray, God, that you just um, guide my lips tonight, Lord, as I try to uh, teach something out of your word. I pray, God, that it can be a blessing. I pray, Lord, that, uh, Lord, we can get to know you, Lord, uh, even more through hearing your word tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, before we get started, I was going to go ahead and um, tell you guys about a story of a guy named Martin Gluth. And Martin Gluth uh, obviously was a famous cyclist. And if you know anything about these guys, they spend years and years uh, practicing and preparing and uh, thousands of dollars worth of equipment, so on and so forth. And uh, so in 2016, he entered into one of the biggest cycling races uh, known at that time, and uh, he was ahead. Uh, hundreds of cyclists racing in this race and and he's ahead by furlongs i mean he was he really had a good lead and was approaching the finish line and so confident in his winnings that uh, he began to cheer and look behind him and as he turned behind him to see 
where the second place guy was, he actually fell and crashed his bike and long story short, uh, didn't win. So we can see here the damaging effects of many times looking behind us when our eyes should look right on, as the Bible says. Uh, go with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17 and verse number 31, Luke 17, 31. It says, In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. So we find here that uh, Christ has given us an example here to remember uh, the wife of Lot and her turning back and her looking back. No doubt there's going to be times in our, uh, even our Christian life when our flesh remembers the things of the past, remembers an old sin, remembers an old desire that uh, we had at once. And uh, let me just tell you, it's, it's natural to have those kind of desires. Uh, for example, if you've ever been a smoker or a drinker or anything like that, and uh, man, you, you smell a whiff of that favorite brand of cigarette or cigar you used to smoke, and uh, your flesh is, is going to desire that, all right? There's, there's not a whole lot that you can do uh, to avoid things like that, but through the power of Jesus Christ and being full of the Holy Spirit, we won't get to a point where we're actually turning back in desire to do those things. Uh, like I said, when we were saved and we were sanctified and, and justified through God, our Holy Spirit and our soul it was saved. But our flesh has not been saved. It has not been redeemed yet. So our flesh is naturally going to incline towards that same sin of the past, maybe in uh, Lot's wife's case here, but I think she actually took it a step further. I'm going to give you some principles tonight that I think will help us in uh, the title of this devotion, No Turning Back, No Turning Back. So we find here that God, even in His mercy and His love uh, for us and even for Lot and his family, gave him a chance to escape and leave the city, leave the land, because God had a plan for it, and this plan wasn't necessarily to give it another chance or um, even continue to be long-suffering, but to actually destroy this nation. And he gave them more than one chance to uh, escape the city, and we find here, just thinking of some of the opportunities that Lot's wife had, number one, I believe she had a, a godly family. I know poor Lot, man, I know he wasn't maybe quite at the level Abraham was, but I think he was still considered uh, even just, the Bible says in Second Peter, um, talking about how they rescued uh, the just Lot. So they actually called Lot just at this time. So I do believe that she did have uh, some good godly influences in her life. Maybe Lot at one point in time was the right leader of the home and saw the blessing of God and, and saw the provision of God and had more or less a, a godly family there and, and even an uncle like Abraham and to, uh, to get some influence from him, no doubt, in my life. My uncle Mike obviously has been a great uh, influence in, in my life. I can go to him anytime I want and seek godly counsel and any, even things outside of the ministry. I, I I trust in his discernment, and he's been a great influence in my life. So I do believe that some of those sit-down conversations that I've had with him and some of the examples that he set forth, even in our family, has helped me make the right decisions. And I believe that Lot's wife had that. I believe she had a good influence with Abraham. And um, even uh, thinking of the time when Abraham actually rescued Lot and his family when they were taken captive and uh, no doubt they saw the powerful hand of God and his protection there and so she's no stranger to who God is and what he's capable of and what his love is and means to us and she had a godly family some good godly influences and number two she also had a heavenly visit man um, I don't know about you but I've never personally that I know of had an encounter like they did with angels 
uh, sent from heaven to literally physically rescue them out of this situation. Uh, they have an opportunity to have angels even in their home, uh, even though they, they, I believe, resisted them to some point. Uh, but they, they, man, they saw the power of God. They saw what God could do. They saw what he's capable of. They saw that God loved them. But yet we find here in Genesis 19, verse number 16, it says, And while he lingered, which is red flag, the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. Wow, you talk about some power there. I, I don't believe that they were necessarily drugged out of the city, but they, uh, in God's mercy, was so long-suffering towards them that I don't believe he necessarily did it out of their will, because even God many times won't do that You know, in our lives. He's given us a free will. Uh, he, he gives us an opportunity to seek him and to make the right decisions. And if anyone's dying and going to hell. I had a friend one time tell me, how can you serve a God who can send someone to hell? And I said, God doesn't send anyone to hell. I said, they practically send themselves. God is the one who offered an escape to hell. So we find here that God in his mercy, man, brought them out of the city. And verse number 17 says, and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Some clear instruction here. Neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So we find here that the angels have given him very clear instruction on what to do, what not to do. And this word stay here in the plane is talking about don't even stop in the plane. Don't, don't slow down. Don't stop walking. Don't set up camp. Just keep going until you reach the mountains. So we find here, verse number 24, moving on, it says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire uh, from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities that uh, which grew upon the ground. But, verse 26, his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So we find here that in her turning back to look, uh, we find several interesting points here. And number one, I'm, I'm going to just iterate the importance of in our Christian life, the times when we try to turn back to the world, um, problems will always follow, uh, obviously. Uh, number one, we're going to notice the evidence of looking back. Letter A, I believe a, a great ev evidential uh, uh, aspect of turning back to the world, to those desires, is letter A, disobedience. Uh, verse 17, like I said, it came to pass, and they brought him forth abroad. He said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So he gave them very clear instruction, and I believe that she deliberately disobeyed those instructions, not, not just out of rebellion, but because of something uh, greater, which we're going to see a little bit later, Luke 9.62 says, And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So we find here that uh, even Christ gave us the example in the New Testament about the importance of moving forward in your ministry, in your Christian life, trusting in the Lord without looking back. Now that's not to say that we can't think back upon the memories of our past life, maybe before we were saved. The Bible says that we were created uh, as, an, as a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But um, it's not necessarily bad to think about the things of the past, but don't dwell on them. And certainly don't get to a point where you're lusting after the things of the past. Man, I wish I could have a cigarette like I used to. Oh, I wish I could have one more night of just partying with the guys like we used to. And I, I, I never like it, even when pastors tend to glorify their days of sin. And they talk about, you know, back in the days and they did this and they did that. And I'm thinking that's obviously nothing to brag about. No doubt we can tell how God had brought us from one point to another. But to look back on our sin, I believe... Um, many times is, is a form of disobedience to the Lord. Uh, verse 26 says, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. 
So we find here this word looked. Uh, she actually looked with intention. It wasn't just glancing back or looking to see what's happening. Uh, she looked back. Uh, it, it means to look, to consider with pleasure, favor, or care. And even here in this verse, in verse 26, so his wife looked back from behind him, it says. And actually doing a study and breaking down this passage here, that, that phrase from behind him uh, is the Greek word achar, A-C-H-A-R, means from a distance. So we find that in this case, it's not that she was walking with the family, they're all huddled together and they're, they're escaping toward the mountain, all of a sudden she looks back and boom, pillar of salt. Uh, I'd like to think that God's a little more merciful than that. Actually, when she looked back, she was a distance from her family. She was lingering back. And she was, I believe, in her heart, looking back with an intention of returning back uh, in her heart. So we believe that uh, letter A, one of the evidence of going back, even in our Christian life, is disobedience. Man, you find a Christian that is not willing to be obedient to the Lord, that's a Christian many times that... Uh, is really forsaking the future blessings of God because he's more concerned about the past sin in his life and maybe going back to that old life. And think about the children of Israel. Many of them tried to turn back and go back to Israel, and they, they forgot what it was like. Man, they had uh, slavery. Uh, they couldn't make their own decisions, living under the bondage of Pharaoh and, and just, just these bad circumstances. And they get out here in the wilderness, and they have a few bad nights, and, and they get to thinking about, the comfort of that old life, that life of sin, that life of spiritual slavery, and they wanted to go back. But we didn't find really in any instance in the Old Testament where the ones that tried to turn back ever even made it back. So as a Christian, I believe that we need to march forward in obedience to the Lord without, without turning back. Let her be not only by disobedience, but sometimes even by doubt. Philippians 1 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, which he that begun a good work in you will perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. Um, it's easy to say many times that we trust in the Lord, and it's, it's a little bit harder to actually support that with, with actions. Um, if you've ever been approached with an opportunity to serve, leave a job, leave the comfort of uh, maybe even your home, I remember, man, when God called us to missions, that was, that was tough. Um, so we had times of doubt in our life, like how, how are we going to be, you know, supported financially? How's this going to work? How's it? Many times you just got to really just trust in the Lord and, and, and not doubt. No doubt that leaving uh, Sodom was a, a, a pretty big transition for them and their family, and just being uprooted just like that. And no doubt in my mind, maybe they had some doubts, but I believe that more than just doubts and even the disobedience, I believe that uh, letter C, desire, played more of a key in any of the three. It says um, in Luke twelve thirty four, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I believe to a certain aspect, the treasure of the heart of Lot's wife was Sodom. I believe that she had grown so comfortable in Sodom that that's where her heart was. That's where her treasure was. Um, I think Spurgeon said it best. It said, Lot and his wife were in the worst of all possible places. They had too much of the world to be happy in the Lord and too much of the Lord to be happy in the world. <laughs> and I think that holds true even with us. As a Christian, let me tell you, if you're born again, you're never going to be back, able to go back to your glory days and sin and drink and party and cuss and do what you want without being just miserable. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit won't let you. Uh, it, it will always prick your heart and will always try to steer you in, in the right direction. And many times uh, those that are trying to be happy in the Lord... But they still have ties to their sin and things like that. They'll never, they'll never be happy in the Lord until you first make that decision to not turn back, but let thine eyes look right on, as the Bible says. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that they were, like I said, pretty comfortable in Sodom. I mean, 
think of it like this their kids maybe went to the local high school sodom memorial high school who knows but they were comfortable there uh, Lot's wife may have had even a, a book study there with some ladies and, and they had their friends and they had their acquaintances and they had you know their life established there but we find here how can you establish such a life in a place like that in, in such a perverse place we find here in, in chapter 18 and verse 32 when Abraham was pleading with the Lord he said oh let not the Lord be angry and I will speak with this once for adventure ten shall be found there and he said I will not destroy it for ten's sake so not even ten righteous were found in Sodom so it makes me think what kind of friends Sodom's or uh, Lot's wife may have had in that time what kind of friends their children had in that time uh, we even find that you know, even while the angels were there, there were people trying to force their way into their home, trying to have sexual relationships with these angels. It's just, just a wicked, wicked place. How can a Christian become that comfortable there to where your heart's desire is linked so much to that place where you're willing to disobey God and turn your back on the future God has for you and the mercy that God had for you and turn around with intention to look back on a place like that. James 4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. 1 John 2 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever you've heard the term we've got to love the sinner and hate the sin and man i believe that was almost the opposite with lot's wife there, there was something in her heart that was pulling her back to such a sinful place and sinful lifestyle that she was willing to turn her back on her family on the lord and turn back towards sodom so we find evidence of going back. Number two, to finish, we find the consequences of going back. Uh, verse 26 says, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So notice his punishment was, number one, immediate. It was, it was very immediate. Um, God didn't direct her, no, 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 don't look back. Don't look back. Remember I told you. Remember. No, it, it, was, very, it was very swift and immediate. And let me tell you, sooner or later, uh, we're going to see the judgment of a sovereign God. Carl said it really well Sunday morning. He said, we live in a day and age where a lot of these churches, the progressive churches, emerging churches, that all they want to preach is the love of God. But how can you really know the love of God without knowing the judgment of God? And, and knowing, man, in, in his wife's case, knowing that God loved them so much to pull them out of such a place, allow them to escape such damnation being judged with a city like this and then turning your back on that i think of those that who constantly reject god's salvation even i mean how can you reject such love that god has shown for us and choose to go to a place like hell over accepting a god that is loving but he's also a god of judgment and through that judgment, we can even see his love on how he brought us out and brought them out. So it was a very immediate uh, judgment on her case. And number two, it was intense. Man, it was intense. Uh, he didn't strike her with any kind of a sickness. He didn't, uh, like I said, give her a second warning. Um, it's to say this, that sin is not a game. Um, it's not a game. I've I've seen many times people will try to go back to the world and even Christians and, and they'll see a very swift, very serious judgment and um, we're forsaking our, our own mercy many times when, when we do this. And, and not just to talk about Lot's wife, but even this judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah is a very intense judgment. Uh, he didn't put plagues on this city. He didn't, like I said, strike them with any kind of sickness or boils or anything like that. It was... It was a very intense judgment that he had for them. And number three, it was irreparable, irreparable. Um, I'll tell you this. Jack Isles preached a message one time about missing out on the will of God. Uh, and not just the will of God, but God's perfect will. And I would love, uh, like I said, to be able to stand before a congregation 
and say, I've, I've never done this type of sin or I've never done that, but uh, many times we can't because we have done it. So for those of you that maybe have fallen in the past, maybe have made a mistake, and maybe you can't say, oh, I've never taken a drink of alcohol, or I've never smoked, or I've never uh, had relations outside of marriage, or I've never done this, and it's, it's not the end of the world. But it is irreparable. You can't take those things back. You cannot take those sins back. But thankfully, God is uh, just and merciful. And He'll forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But one of the consequences of that is seeing in our past, even though God forgets it, and He throws into a sea of forgetfulness, Many times we don't forget those sins. They, if you will, haunt us in our future. The devil tries dredging them back up every chance he gets. But we find here, even in this case, in verse number 27, And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord, and he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward the land of the plain. And behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. It was irreparable damage. Imagine seeing this place that was once filled with green fields. And they, they even said in, in my studies that uh, this, this was the area where it may have been the Garden of Eden and just, just a beautiful place of prosperity. No doubt this was the area that when Abraham gave Lot first choice on which land he was going to take when they separated, man, Lot immediately gravitated towards that because he could see the provision. He could see the valley. He could see just the beautiful cities and all the great plains and things like that. And, and what, what was so great, even to the eye, is now just a heap of ash burned. It's irreparable. So make no mistake, in the Christian life, God is going to give us opportunities to escape sin, to escape a sinful life. But when we turn back, that's letting God know exactly where our heart is. And I, I don't want to be guilty of that this evening. I, I, I love the Lord, and don't get me wrong, my flesh it still desires that sin. But God being with us, help us not to turn back with an intention and a desire to go back to the things of this world. Man, keep, keep moving forward. They have a phrase in Honduras, siempre adelante. It's always forward, okay? Uh, I believe that's what we should have uh, in closing. A guy by the name of Simon Merrick. Through his efforts of an American Baptist missionary, he was called to renounce his faith by a local village chief. And um, here we find uh, Simon refused to renounce his faith. And he declared these words, I've decided to follow Jesus. At that moment, his two sons were murdered in response uh, to his answer. Later on, in his response to the threats of murdering his wife, he continued saying, Though none go with me, still I will follow. At that moment, his wife was murdered and Later on, even he himself was executed while he sang, The world behind me, the cross before me. We find here that even in the moments of his death, he wasn't willing to turn back. He said, all right, I'll renounce as long as you just save my life. No, because those that try to save their life will lose it. And those that lose their life will preserve it. Because you know why? God's in control as long as we decide to follow him. But one of the curious things and interesting and great things about this story is that chief watching his announced faith uh, was actually converted. And what was once a village of cannibals and headhunters is now uh, one of the pivotal points in the following missionaries' ministry of kind of a hub for the work that they were doing in this area because he had gotten saved and then uh, in response to that several people in that village were saved by seeing his faith so that gives us even another reason not to turn back when times get tough you may want to turn back to the old lifestyle the old sin the old habits but let me tell you this the lord's washing obviously 
but you've got other people in your life that are watching too. Man, I can't turn back. Number one, because I want to love the Lord and I want to keep moving forward and, and have His blessing. But I can't turn back. You know why? Because my family's following me. I've got three kids that are following me. I've got a wife that's following me. I've got a, an entire Spanish congregation that are following me, other brothers and sisters in Christ that are, are seeing the way we live our lives. And we, we can't turn back. We can't turn back. So keep moving forward. Keep trusting in the Lord. And remember Lot's wife in times like... Um, of times of difficulty and times when your flesh desires to turn back just keep moving forward and keep trusting in the lord and his sovereignty and he'll take care of us all right heavenly father we thank you lord for this day thank you for all you've given us thank you lord for your word i pray god that you'd bless it i pray god that it be a blessing to the hearers and that we can also be a doer of your word in christ's name we pray amen